Uh, next up is Carrie Love. She's a soft roboticist for Super Releaser with Brooklyn R&D Consultancy. She's also a uh, has been a technical expert on five NASA contracts and has developed costumes for Broadway for more than a decade, including Spider-Man: Turn Off the Dark. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> and was inducted in the Smithsonian Collection. And has built puppet costumes for the Jim Henson Company. Please welcome Carrie Love. Oh, that's not my water. Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, um, I'm here to talk to you about soft robotics for space, um, which uh, is something that's near and dear to my heart, uh, having worked for a commercial spacesuit company for three years and being an owner of that company and also having moved now to a soft robotics company. Um, let's see, I just wanna frame where we are to start with, which is it's going to be kind of a high level overview. And part of that is because it is rare that I go into a room where either someone knows everything about soft robotics or that they know everything about space. And kind of at the intersection of that is where I want to be bringing everyone into the same conversation. So whichever part you know less about is hopefully the part you're going to take away a lot. If you know everything about both of those, please come talk to me afterwards. I want to hear from you. So what is a soft robot is where we're going to start. So. Just rolling back things, like I'm sure this isn't new to this community, that a lot of times people get bogged down when you say robot and they think like anthropomorphic things or they think of things in industrial lines, but just to break it down to a much more simple place, that it's complex series of actions carried out automatically, usually computer controlled. Um, and then a soft robot is where you have soft or flexible components is the um, functional parts. Um, I have Baymax Max on my slide because it's the only soft robot that's in pop culture that I could think of right away. And I love Baymax as an introduction to talking about soft robots because Baymax was directly inspired by real research. So Dr. Chris Atkinson had a vision to build healthcare robots that were inflatable so you can work with patients safely. Um, obviously, traditional robots can damage people um, it's why Baxter exists. It's why there's kind of all these approaches to say, how can we work more closely with robots? Um, in its strictest form, soft robotics refers to soft actuators, um, but I also like to include in this conversation hybrid robotics. That it's not about all hard or all soft, but that some of the juiciest solutions is when you combine the two pathways. And the other thing is that um, soft robotic approaches make a lot of sense when you're thinking about nature and um, not just nature, mimicking nature, but inspired by nature. Um, and the reason why that is true is if you go to things that are non-geological or not weather systems and you look at everything that moves, the majority of those things are all soft or they're a combination of soft and hard together. But if you look at the scope of human engineering, it's very dominated by all hard systems. So we're leaving that much opportunity on the ground. What's it good for? Um, a classical soft robotics problem is handling fragile or irregular materials. So tomatoes are really popular to think about because they're all irregular. If you squeeze them too hard, it's like a lovely image that they squish. A light bulb is the same problem. So in this slide, we have a picture of a traditional robotic solution with a hand holding a light bulb. You can think of the level of complexity that's needed in the sensing and control to make that possible. Whereas in the middle, we have a soft robotic gripper. Um, it's one that was developed at Super Releaser Lab for a forthcoming book we're writing for Make um, on soft robotics you can make at home. And this is literally just on and off is the control system, and it can pick up a wide variety of things. Um, there's also vacuum grippers here, so that's like granular, granular gripping, and then there's kind of a more anthropomorphic hand that's pneumatic in this slide. So bio-inspired stability. So this is a very famous blooper slide of the Atlas robot, and I love this, uh, not because this robot isn't amazing, like it's easy to poke fun because this is a pretty hard problem, but if you look at the bottom of the feet, they're just flat plates. And trying to use flat plates to like cross something this irregular and hard is 
suboptimal as a solution. If you look to the bio-inspired space, you can look at a thing like a goat. Now, a goat has embodied compliance in its foot. It has graded um, durometer through the foot. It has soft and hard together in compression. And so it is perfectly adapted to be very stable. Though I do like to joke with my business partner that, like, don't underestimate a goat as a control system. Like, a goat's pretty, pretty far advanced <laughs> if we wanted to duplicate the control system. But you can see the advantage of this co graded compression approach. And so here are some soft robotic solutions for stability that are inspired from nature. So this carbon fiber one with um, padded bits is a lot similar to a goat foot. And this one with the kind of padded paws is like for a cheetah inspired a gate robot. Um, and you can imagine if that had hard ends on the bottoms of its feet, it would be much less effective. So bio-inspired, the diversity of existing solutions. So sometimes when you look at traditional robotics, you go to the like tried and true solutions. But when you go to the bio-inspired space, you see a totally different way to solve this problem. So the elephant trunk is very different than the gripper claw. And then if you interpret that into a soft or a soft and hard, you can reinterpret that in very, very different ways. So these are both very similar in kind of their inspiration points, but the mechanisms are quite different. And so I think that's exciting to know how broad the existing solutions to mine from can be. Uh, human object integration. So um, the military and the health space is, are both really obsessed with like, human augmentation robotics that are wearable. Um, and this is a military robot that's all hard components. There are two reasons why this is not a great solution to this problem. So one is like the human factors. Humans don't integrate to hard parts very well. Most people try to solve this with padding. Um, it's not wearable long term. You also end up with a situation where the robot can harm you. Again, that's something we think about a lot when thinking about humans and robots working together. And the other disadvantage is the mass versus power problem. So you end up with these big robots, but they need so much power that you end up with a bigger battery pack or you end up more tethered. So if we can circumvent that by using lightweight soft materials, we gain a lot of efficiency in the system. Um, this middle one, that's the animated one, is actually on Hackaday. It's also from Super Releaser, my company. This was a proof of concept for a cerebral palsy um, assist. So in that space, it's that people end up in a clenched position. And so it was to see whether or not we could make a pneumatically actuated uh, device that would help them release from the pressure of the clench position, uh, but also be wearable long term. Um, again, it's an early proof of concept, but you can see more about it on Hackaday. So durability and adaptability. So there are a lot of places that traditional robots don't like to go. Um, underwater is a classic problem again. Uh, the military is very invested in the idea that maybe they've reached the edge of innovation they can get through things like submarines. If they want to go deeper, if they want to have better sonar, that hard shell is working against those goals. So looking at soft solutions, because that's what nature does underwater, is a large opportunity space. The other thing is that you can't necessarily explore dangerous places with a very expensive hard robot. So you don't want to do cliff science with your million dollar robot that will fall off and break. So this robot here, this walker, can be run over by a car and then keep walking. So that's kind of changing the, the space of where robots can go by adding soft components. OK, so now I'm going to switch um, tax right now. We've kind of given an overview of soft robots and what they're good for and, and why we want to explore this more. Now, when you start talking about space problems, it comes down to the idea of a mission context. And the mission context is to get anything to space and for it to work. There are inherent problems to that. And if you, if you find engineering trade-offs that get you closer to a viable mission, that is your goal. 
So one of these concepts is a log parts count. Um, it's a basic in engineering, like fewer parts, there's fewer things to break. Really, really valuable when you're in space and can't necessarily fix things. But also low parts count ends up in being a financial win if you are doing space exploration because every single part needs to go through a very rigorous verification validation that can bog down the whole mission. So if you can reduce the number of parts, then you can get your mission going faster. The strength to weight ratio is something we talked about kind of in the military and health exoskeleton, but it's really true in a space context because launch is so expensive. So a uh, launch to low Earth orbit is a range, depending who your launch provider is. Um, the 1K, I think, is like a little hand wavy from SpaceX. It's like future projections. Maybe 10K is more realistic per pound. And for Mars, that just gets enormous. The low end is 14K per pound. And maybe the realistic expectation of what that is is more like $35,000 per pound. Adds up very fast. Stowable and deployable is another mission consideration. So it's not just that you're limited how much weight, you're also limited by the volume of your payload in the launch vehicle. So trying to get more things packed in tightly in a smaller space is a, is a mission win. So also adaptable with fewer control inputs. When you think about the load of control systems, I like to think of the problem of Mars. If I wanna communicate with a robot that's on Mars, it takes 20 to 30 minutes for the signal to get there and 20 to 30 minutes for any information to come back. So you're on a 40 minute loop to get any direct communication. Um, so if you can have fewer control inputs, then you can do science faster. And then uh, the potential to use proven materials. Although new material science is like a very large part of our approach to space exploration, the like on ramp from when something works in a laboratory as like a first concept for a new material to when it gets through verification and validation to actually be used in a mission is very long. So it can kind of slow down innovation. You don't want that to stop happening. Like it's very, very vital to long-term mission goals. But if you can make solutions with things that what they say has flight heritage, so things that have been flown before, then you can see more immediate innovation on the ground. Um, one of the examples I gave um, underneath potential to use pro proven materials has to do with the wide thermal range that space exploration requires. So, you know, negative, I think it's negative 200 C, but I'm not, I'm like numbers like that just elude me and I look them up when I need them. But two, very, very hot. So materials that perform within that envelope are pretty challenging to find. So anything you already have, you want to use, and you want to use to the best of its advantage. OK, so spacesuits. Part of my experience in working in the mission context is directly related to spacesuits. Um, if we go back to the definition of soft robots, or to the definition of robots that is about computer control and automatic systems, spacesuits fall under this category. Um, essentially, spacesuits are wearable spaceships. Uh, traditional spacesuits work by being an inflated balloon, creating the amount of ambient pressure around you that keeps you from getting the bends keeps, and keeps you protected from the vacuum of space. So the things that are negatives about the current state of the art in spacesuits are because it's a pressure system, it takes a lot of work to move. Everything springs back to the, what they call the neutral position. And when you think of doing an eight-hour EVA where you're working with your hands, your ability to do effective work decreases the more tired you get from cycling these things, from moving your spacesuit. Uh, punctures can be catastrophic. One millimeter puncture in your spacesuit means near instant death. So, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. 
Uh, traditional spacesuits are very bulky, so you have reduced mobility and tactility. What I like to say about why we want human spaceflight is we send humans to space because we have brains and because we have hands. We can solve problems and we can immediately implement them with our flexible tools. Um, if you have reduced mobility and tactility, you're taking away some of those advantages of human spaceflight. And heavy, the huge launch cost. So these EVA spacesuits can be about 300 pounds. So when we go back to those numbers about launch cost, if you think how much that costs to send something to Mars, it's huge. So enter the new paradigm for what people think spacesuits are going to be. It's called mechanical counterpressure. So instead of creating a bubble of air around ourselves, you can protect everything except for your head and your lungs and your breathing by direct physical pressure. So if you can create even physical pressure across the body that's the same as air pressure, your, your body doesn't know the difference. So this is actually an old idea. It was first tested in the 60s by Dr. Paul Webb. Um, so here, here's some fabulous, very sexy photos of him. I, I like the flesh color particularly. I think that's, that's really wonderful. But why would you want to switch to physical pressure? There are a lot of advantages to this uh, solution. So one is that local damage to the suit means increased time to mitigate. So we talked about one millimeter hole in your suit in a traditional spacesuit means, you know, <laughs> all the gas leaves, you die. Um, if you get a one millimeter hole in your mechanical counterpressure suit, there is no effect which is amazing. And then in vacuum chamber testing, they found that exposed area of something as large as the hand would take 10 to 20 minutes till you fainted. So that's not even death. That's like till you faint. And then there's more time beyond that where someone who was on the mission with you could also save you once you fainted. So it's a huge um, risk mitigation. Uh, there's reduced cooling equipment. So these pressures, these pressure vessel versions of spacesuits, it's you. You have these very complicated systems with like flowing water and like a sublimation through vacuum. Like it gets very complex very fast. But if you can do physical pressure, you could actually have your sweat directly into the vacuum of space through the mesh of the fabric. So it's pretty fabulous in terms of reduced cooling. So this is probably, if you are someone who follows human spaceflight, the version of mechanical counterpressure that you've seen. This is the bio suit from Dr. Dava Newman at MIT. Um, seeing her in this prototype, you really see like lighter and stowable are huge advantages if you go ahead and go with a mechanical counterpressure system. Uh, a lot of times people who are less versed in the details of spacesuits ask me like, well, why aren't we using this now? That's because this is a proof of concept suit right now. It uses shape changing wire that you heat up to a thermal range that is not really suitable for humans. <laughs> so then you, you, you get a negative that, that takes away the positive in terms of like wearability and cooling considerations and also, um, the problem of even pressure is actually very complex because we have all these concavities. And if you don't manage to get perfectly even pressure, what happens is you start getting, um, I'm trying to think of the word right now. Essentially, your fluids flow to the place where the pressure is the least, which is not a great, not a great place to be. And um, the other reason is that um, as a concept right now, it uh, is really quite a few unsolved problems still. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to turn this beautiful proof of concept into something that's mission viable. So this enters the place where I got to work directly on this problem. So I worked with a company called Final Frontier Design, and they got a contract to do a proof of concept for a mechanical counterpressure glove. Um, I'm gonna step back just one moment. Uh, Mechanical counterpressure is such an important idea that there are many people working on this simultaneously. And some of the ideas are very fringe. Like there's one where it's like, we're gonna spray something onto your body to like change the amount of pressure you need. But 
Um, I really love looking at engineering problems like this where it, your eggs aren't all in one basket. Lots of people are working on it simultaneously. So anyway, they wanted to have a glove. Uh, NASA put out a request for proposals that was specifically about gloves. And there are quite a few reasons why they wanted to do a glove. One is the streamlined, so you get the increased tactility and mobility. Traditional glove, you can see like, you're not gonna have much mobility and tactility in that versus this is an early proof of concept for mechanical counter pressure. Um, the next reason why gloves first is the complexity of the hand mirrors other parts of the body. So if you look at number one here, it's like here, it's a little bit like a ball joint, like a hip or a shoulder, like it's not directly the same, but there's a lot you can learn from that. Uh, number two is like knees and elbows. Number three is like something like an ankle. Uh, number four is the concavity problem of the palm, which directly relates to things like backs of knees and armpits and groinal areas. And also, they why gloves first is they have a goal to integrate with existing EVA suits. So they want to do modular upgrades. They don't want to change the whole spacesuit all at once. They want to do a cheaper, more reliable, minimal risk way to start onboarding a brand new concept. Um, so there's actually, it's kind of a funny anecdote about Russian spacesuits. They have a tourniquet where if you have a suit failure in your glove, you can like tie it off um, and cut off circulation to your hand to save your life. And when asking cosmonauts about this, they said, well, the pain is significant, but it's not worse than death. <laughs> Um, and I think that when I, when I think about the modular upgrades problem, I think it's like a way that we can mitigate risk. So if your mechanical counter pressure glove fails, maybe we would choose to have a tourniquet or something like that too when we're doing modular upgrades. Um, this is an interesting slide because, um, sorry, never mind. Ask me about rapid prototyping after the talk and we can talk about this because this is a proof of concept we did in the pre-proposal period. And this was through Super Releaser as a subcontractor for Final Frontier. So the other reason why gloves first, you can iterate small and then scale up. So you can, there's the advantage that sometimes it's easier to make things bigger than make them smaller. Like anyone who's made a laptop can be like, miniaturization is super hard. Um, but it's also true in kind of these human level problems. So let's scale up rather than have to miniaturize. And also, you can postpone these like nasty human factors problems. So groins, armpits, and lungs are still totally unsolved problems when we talk about mechanical counterpressure. Because we have to figure out your shape changing in this way. How do you apply direct pressure to a groin that's perfectly even? And uh, also, how do you make a gasket that goes to between where your head is and where the rest of, where's the transition point is a very hard question. So if the rest of the proof of concept is advanced, you're in a better starting point to solve those even harder questions. So I'm gonna move on now from, oh, sorry. I'm gonna move on now from spaces just to talk about other NASA funded bio-inspired robotics. Um, I'm calling it the menagerie because they, you, they end up really loving animals and I, I love that about the funded projects. Um, so the first one is a squid. So why would you want a squid in space? So you want to explore the moons of Europa. Oh wait, the moon Europa, not moons of Europa. The moon Europa. So you're going to need a swimming robot. So the concept for this is that they would have a, a power scavenging robot uh, that swims underneath the surface uh, of the ice. And uh, a lot of times when people ask me about soft robotics and rovers, they get really caught up in our pre-existing image of what rovers are. So the Mars Curiosity rover is amazing and is doing really wonderful work, but it really works because the conditions on Mars are, are less far away from being like Earth than some other problems. So if you go to, so you, if you go to moons that have no atmosphere, you can't use parachutes. <laughs> so suddenly the things that you use to solve Earth Earth-like planet problems don't work at all. Um, so 
The next one is a fly. So the fly's foot is really interesting because flies aren't super smart, um, but they can climb upside down on things like glass and sideways on anything. And the way that works is they have these tiny hooks uh, on the ends of hairs of their feet. And what they do is they push their foot against the glass and a certain amount of them hook in the tiny crevices. And then not all of them need to hook. Only a certain percentage of them actually need to get in there to make the whole walking work. So if you translate that idea into a hybrid robot, what you end up with is, are these like little tiny, little, these flexible hairs that have a hook at the end. And you can see there's someone bending one so you can see how the function works. And then you end up with these feet that have the same concept. It's gripping into the rock. Only some small percentage of them is actually hooking and then you put it onto a rover. And this is not a flip slide. This is actually a rover walking upside down on rock using these kinds of feet. And then tensegrity robotics. Um, this is really an interesting problem because when I talk about bio-inspired robotics, people will look at this and say like, that's not bio-inspired. And I was like, no, no, it totally is. Um, Vita Sunspiral, who came up with uh, this concept with a few other colleagues, was inspired partially by like Buckminster Fuller structures, like where hard and soft don't touch each, uh, hard components aren't touching each other. They are held together in tension by soft components. But a lot of the work in this area is inspired by things like human spines or animal spines. We think of the, our skeleton as being a bunch of hard components hooked together, but that's not the reality of that. Our bones aren't directly hooked to each, to each other. They're, they're held together with ligaments and tendons and things. They have soft components keeping them in tension. So the concept about these robots is that you could, one, you could flat pack them. So if you're talking about the mission context, again, you can flat pack them. They're incredibly light. They're incredibly cheap. The idea is you could just like, litter something, you could litter a celestial body with them and have lots of them moving around at once. You can have them do that high value cliff science because it doesn't matter if they fall off. Um, and they don't need a parachute. You can just throw them directly from space onto the body. This is an interesting thing as well. Their project has an open source component where they have made simulation um, a simulation program called the NASA Ten Tensegrity Robotics Toolkit. And so you can program in this. They're actually, they have a call for, for C++ programmers to help them because uh, their programming is a little weak in the interface uh, side of that. So that's, I think, of interest maybe to some people. So to move away from the bio-inspired space and talk about just general questions, when I think about what a soft robot is, Maybe a lot of you have heard about the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module that's attached to the ISS now. It's a great concept. And my question for people generally, is it a soft robot? Is it already a soft robot or a hybrid robot? And if it's not, would we see benefits if we made it more of a soft robot in the future? And some final thoughts, just winding up. Um, so hybrid solutions. A lot of times when we're approaching a problem from a traditional lens, through a traditional lens, it would be worth taking a moment to say, would adding a soft component make this easier or better? So if you think about that light bulb problem, you could probably just add foam to the tips of the fingers of that, that robot and it would still perform better than it is right now in the picture. Um, so potentially reduce the complexity of your control system. Bio-inspired, I love the bio-inspired space. I was really happy to be in the lineup after Dr. Gordon talking about the like, sensing components of bio-inspired. Um, because nature has tons of pre-existing solutions. Um, evolution has made everything optimized to work really well, so why wouldn't we want to copy that? Um, oops, I moved the slide. Okay, uh, a focus on emergent fields. So. When people approach that question of like, what should my pro next project be? Which is something that they talked about earlier in Hackaday, why Hackaday set up their contest. Um, the answer I have for people 
for that is work on an emergent problem. So work on an emerging field. Soft robotics as a formalized discipline is only about 10 years old, which means that I get to speak and be an expert having only worked on this problem for less than three years, um, which is pretty juicy as an idea space. And the thing is too, when you're working on an emergent problem, it doesn't matter if you're credentialed at all. Like, you can come up with something that's as good or better than someone's making in a military lab or a university lab in your home because it's so unexplored. And then if you are new to space exploration and you really want to work on space problems, my advice is you need to learn your mission context. So the ESA and NASA have a lot of documentation about what counts to them in a mission context. So learning what that is means that you'll be a better problem solver for that space. So I gave you like a light introduction to mission context, but the more you can know about mission context before you start problem solving, the better your project will be to, to be a good fit in that space. Oh, and this is another thing that people should ask me about if they are interested. I am super excited about opportunities for outsiders to get government funding. It turns out the government's like, oh my god, innovators, how do we get to them? And I'm like, oh, you hide all the goodies. Like, you've made it really, really hard to figure out where this, these funding sources are. So I really want to do some work with people about how do we share about where the funding opportunities are to work on these emergent fields and these really exciting problems. They're looking for us. So a few places to look if you want to do more about soft robotics or about space. Um, so obviously Hackaday has a tag, it's soft robotics. You'll see a lot of work from Super Releaser um, on that particular tag. Uh, Instructables has a lot of lower cost soft robotics projects, so if you wanna do something that's more simple just to like dip your toe in the water, Instructables is a nice place to look. Uh, Harvard has a soft robotics toolkit and they're a really great resource, but it can be really challenging to implement. It ends up being very expensive. They're recommending some, the software tools they talk about, some of them are really expensive. Some of the things are cheaper and easier to implement. And uh, Paradox Robotics is a place where they found that they couldn't source the hardware they needed to implement the soft robotics toolkit. So they just bought it in bulk and like are now selling the kits. Um, it's still pretty expensive though. Um, Aiden Leach is XYZ Aiden. Um, oh, he's gonna hate that this is on my slide. He's a high schooler, but I'm only saying that because a part, again, the part on the emergent fields bit is that um, he is a high school student who publishes in the open source and his work is so valuable that when I went and spoke at Yale, there were there were people who were doing their senior thesis on soft robotics and they said, we are reproducing Aiden's work as part of our senior thesis. And um, he also publishes a soft robotics daily, which is a digest of soft robotics news, and he shares his mold designs on Thingiverse. Um, NASA tech briefs, NASA, like, the government has all kinds of free goodies and one of them is they have a free magazine about materials science and technology. All you have to do is sign up and they send you this like beautiful magazine about the cutting edge of technology. And the NASA Tensegrity Robotics Toolkit, as I said, uh, you, you can download it, you can tinker around, you can see what it's like to make these simulations of Tensegrity structures. And if you felt interested, they are looking for coders to help them improve it. And then Super Releaser, so that's the company I'm from. We have a blog. We also have forums that we dream that someday people will come to and talk about soft robotics. Right now it's like three people. But uh, if you guys all get passionate about soft robotics, we hope to see you there. And um, yeah, woo, blast off with soft robotics. This is a soft robotic propulsion system which didn't fit in the talk but I thought we needed to watch the slide. Um, yes, so I'm Carrie Love. Um, I hope that you found this useful and come talk to me uh, about both soft robotics and space and the mission context and everything else.
Thank <laughs> you.